Okay, so look, a uh, very warm welcome to all of you here um, and to those at the other end of the camera, whether you are in Chorleywood or somewhere else in the world, it's, it's great to be able to talk to you here this evening. Um, so tonight we're going to be continuing our passion series uh, and tonight we're going to look at The Last Supper, something that has inspired artists and writers and millions of Christians for uh, um, over 2,000 years now. So let's just summarize the last uh, sort of few weeks we did in the Passion series. So Martha did a fantastic talk uh, all about what you are bringing with you uh, into Easter. Uh, Joe did a great talk last week, uh, again, on what are the limits of God's authority in our lives, what are we afraid of losing if we fully submit to Jesus, and what is the basis of your hope. And it was one of Joe's last sermons. Very sad. I think the last one is in what, next week or the week after? But Joe, I just want to say we're going to miss you so much. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you here and listening and seeing you grow too as well. Take that with you. So I'm just going to open in prayer quickly. So Lord Jesus, as we read these verses together and recall that last supper in the upper room, the gift of communion ahead of the ultimate price that you paid for us, thank you that you are here with us. Let these words glorify you. Amen. So these are indeed strange times. Uh, we've recently started to see some glimpses of spring, and with it, the promise, the hope, the refuge that homeschooling is almost coming to an end. <laughs> um, teachers, we salute you, we thank you, and we diligently apologize for the damage we've probably caused our children. Uh, you certainly have your work cut out for you. Uh, also this week, I just want to show you that uh, I had some new socks delivered. Here we go. Look, I'll show you these uh, fantastic new socks. Aren't they nice? You see? And I think it says a lot about someone when the single factor that you decide in choosing your socks is something so revolting that your wife and teenage daughters stop stealing them from your sock drawer. Um, so it's been an interesting few weeks leading up to uh, this evening, and I wanted to share a bit about the journey just before we started the main sermon in creating this talk. It's not easy creating a sermon. Clergy have the foresight and experience to occasionally leave it all to the last possible moment. Of course, just so as to leave as much time as possible for the Lord to lay something on their hearts. For the rest of us, there is a journey. As, to be honest, it's even a bit of a spiritual battle that takes place as we study and wait on the Lord. Doubt, fear, ego, busyness, and many other things come out through the cracks. And on the night or the actual time you give the sort of sermon, you hope you don't lose your place and have a total memory blank. But on this occasion, there were actually some really nice coincidences that I wanted to share uh, and suffice to affirm once again that God definitely has a sense of humor. So as Joe was trying to organize the troops and divvy up the various sort of chapters of these sort of four days, he asked us to, asked us to share something about ourselves that the others might not know. Sworn to secrecy, and as far as I'm concerned, people can wear whatever they like at the weekends, but I can share what I, I share with the rest of the group, and that is my, my passion for food, almost an obsession. I think about it a lot, but not purely from a gluttony point of view, honestly, but I like to be creative with my cooking, whether it's the use of a water bath, cooking meat for 48 hours at 56 degrees, or figuring out if it's too cold to light a fire outside and get the grill over the embers to sear something off for friends and family to eat. All the South Africans say, braai. <laughs> I love to think about food and often plan meals days in advance. I thank God genuinely for the creativity that uh, it affords me in doing so. Then perhaps no surprise that I ended up with the Last Supper. At, at the same time, about maybe three or so weeks back, uh, I was already underway with a Bible plan called Visioneering by a guy called Andy Stanley, which was filled with reference, references about preparing and waiting for God's vision for your life to surface. Then about a week later, another dear friend of ours invited us to start a Bible plan to cover the whole of Exodus. Now, she had no idea that I'd been asked to, to do a sermon on the Last Supper, but in Exodus, I got to see more about the details of the origins of the Passover meal. And the Bible plan gave me some amazing insights into the, the significance of this meal and a sense of what it might have been like for Jesus to have shared this with the disciples. And then in our life group, we've been following a study on grace 
and on one week it was my turn to lead, and we covered a section that included some references to the communion meal and asked a really interesting question that none of us had previously considered. Stay tuned to find out a bit later what that was. All right, so look, we're going to read from Luke 22, 7 to 38, so please turn with me in your Bibles now, and hopefully it'll come up on the screen. Then, the day, then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, uh, covenant in, in my blood, which is poured for you. But the, hand of, uh, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They begin to question amongst themselves which of them who this might be. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be considered the greatest. Jesus said to them, The king of the Gentiles lord it over them. The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer to you our kingdom, just as my father conferred one onto me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. But I tell you, that, you must, that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Okay, so I am going to try and break uh, this down into three Ps, um, just to be original, I suppose, uh, and try and weave some theology and biblical context with my own flavor of practical common sense so we can perhaps ascribe some meaning in our lives to what we're going to read about. So the first section is about making preparations. The second section is the Passover meal. And the third section is promise. So just some context, just before this uh, event happened, Satan had already entered Judas and he agreed to, to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I was quite curious actually what 30 pieces of silver was worth. Uh, so I did a little bit of research, a bit of history here. Um, we're assuming the pieces of silver were called uh, tetradachmas, which is about 300 pounds, but it is better to think of it in day's wages. So it was about six months salary. Still hardly a life altering amount. He must have felt pretty awful. 
Jesus, uh, section one. All right, so Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. We see once again this command to go in faith as we did with the cult in Martha's reading a couple of weeks ago. Um, But I was curious also to say what's actually in the Passover meal or the seder meal as it's called. There were six items on the plate. There was a roasted lamb shank uh, uh, representing the sacrificial lamb for the Israelites. There was a roasted egg and something called carpas, which are spring greens to symbolize springtime and renewal. There was Mara and Chazaret, bitter herbs to represent the bitter tears of the Israelites. And then in contrast, Charaset, which is a sweet salad of apples, nuts, wines, and cinnamon. Around the plate would have been uh, some salt water to represent the tears that the items were dipped into to eat. There would have been about three pieces of matzah, which is unleavened bread. And there would have been four cups of wine representing the four promises that God made to the Israelites. I actually have cooked a Passover meal in this very building for about 130 people. Uh, I think it was about 10 years ago or so. Uh, Strangely enough, when you cook 136 lamb shanks, it's actually the last thing you want to eat that evening. Um, But we did do this as a sort of, uh, uh, to, to remember what the Passover meal was and the significance of it. During the meal, the story of Exodus was always told, no matter how familiar it would have been. Can you imagine... (laughs) what it would have been like hearing Jesus tell that story. I think you could have probably heard a pin drop in the room. And the details of the story matter. How God's people were spared, not because they deserved it, but by the blood of the lamb. How the perfect, spotless lamb was selected and presented 10 days before the Passover meal. How Jesus was put in front of Pilate, who found no fault or blame. How no bones of the lamb were to be broken, and that Jesus' bones weren't broken on the cross. How all of the lamb was to be consumed, nothing left, like the empty tomb. How hyssop branches were used to offer Jesus wine, but also used for over a millennia to paint the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the door frames at the top, to the left, and to the right. Ironically, the point of the new story that was unfolding before their eyes was largely lost on the disciples. They didn't yet know what was about to take place and the significance as a basis for the new covenant that God was making. Jesus would have been recalling this story knowing what was to come and yet still in these final hours was busy preparing his disciples for what was to come. So too is the Exodus story full of references to preparation. The Israelites were essentially meandering around the desert for 40 odd years, all the time being prepared to trust in God completely. Before this, Moses was in the desert for another bout of 40 years and he must have resided himself to the knowledge that he was done. He was now just a shepherd. He was far away from the palatial upbringing he was used to. Yet God knew he needed this time to hone and reflect with humility. Then as God prepares him to return to Egypt in an entirely different capacity, Moses all the time questioning him. Exodus 3, verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Personally, if I think I'd seen a burning bush, I'd like to think that would be enough. But no, Moses really wanted some assurances, as you know, from the story. I think that sometimes we need that level of humility in our lives that only comes from difficult times. The hardships we inevitably face through our lives is perhaps like the analogy of silver being heated up in a furnace and having the slag scraped away from the top until the forger can see his own reflection in the silver. So too does God delight when he looks at us and sees his own reflection. But we need to be mindful of our time in preparation. I feel we need to have some intentionality about it. My son and I, Finn, are keen amateur gardeners. We've already planted a few items this year. Radishes, beetroots, peas, pumpkins, tomatoes, chilies. And if we're successful, they will undoubtedly be the most expensive vegetables we will eat all year. We know that in life, if you want to eat bread, you sow wheat. If you want ketchup (laughs) with your fries, sow tomatoes and you get the idea. But if our lives are in fact like small pieces of land and that we're not intentional about what we sow, what else could be allowed to grow? 
Most ultimately destructive forces in our lives start off with something small, holding on to some resentment, perhaps drinking too regularly, or being a bit too liberal when it comes to your choice of TV shows. By extension, addictions rarely form overnight. As we tolerate things in small doses, they can grow and eventually take root. If we're not mindful before we know it, our little gardens are overrun and out of control. So as we acknowledge that times of preparation are important in our lives, try to be intentional, intentional about what you do with your time and your resources. And if there are, in fact, things you are struggling with, find a Christian friend, someone you can trust, and open up. Perhaps pray together and ask for God's help while you're being prepared. Okay, so two, the, the Passover meal. This will, in fact, be the shortest section that I'll cover this evening, not in any way to diminish its enormous significance. After all, this was the very first communion and the one and only tradition that Jesus personally instituted for his church. But I am acutely aware that taking Holy Communion is a deeply personal time for most Christians. And I'm not going to try and interpret what it means for others. That's between each of us and God. But what I did want to reference was that interesting question I mentioned at the start. So our life group had been uh, studying, we are studying, a, uh, a section, a, a series from Scripture Union called uh, Grace, God's Amazing Gift. And in the context of sacraments and the Lord's Supper, the author asked an interesting question, which is this. In what ways should we celebrate the Lord's Supper? I don't know about you, but when I'm remembering the Lord's tremendous sacrifice, feelings of celebration are not close at hand. For me, it's a time of reverence and deeply humble thanks that a wretch like me could only be saved by such a cruel act of punishment. Yet what we agreed in the life group and what the author of the series was, was trying to get across is that there is also the need to remember the entire story, that as we will see again over the coming weeks, that there is in fact an amazing consideration to celebrate. We know that Christ conquered death and that he rose again. So I'll leave this section with that thought that we can indeed celebrate the Lord's Supper. So section three, the final P. It actually changed from patience. That was my original final P. But conferring with my amazing wife, who ironically is very patient, <laughs> um, we agreed that telling people to continue to wait patiently, especially in the current climate, wasn't what the Lord was laying on our hearts. Instead, the last P that I felt we should share together is that of the, of the most significant elements of these verses. Something Jesus mentions time and time again, that of promise. The promise here is that the kingdom of God is yet to come. Verse 16, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Verse 18, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. 20, verse 29, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Sometimes when we are in difficult places, when we're afraid, lonely, sad, or struggling with temptation, it's hard for us to know where to turn. But God promises us in his word that he will never let more come on us than we can bear. He will always provide a way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has taken over you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And although there might be weeping at night, joy comes in the morning. It's always helpful to me to remember that spring follows winter. Spring is my favorite season, just for that reason. The hope of new life pushing up through the decay in the soil. And here is, is Jesus is telling his disciples repeatedly that whatever you go through in life, we have that promise to hold on to. And the best is truly yet to come. That's written on my grandfather's gravestone, and it's very reassuring to me to understand that he knew that, and that his faith 
his legacy in Christ lived on through my parents and on to his great-grandchildren. So in conclusion, there you go, Jesus' last meal. He was almost at the end. He knew what was ahead. And not only did he continue on the journey that God had laid before him, he spent some of his final hours preparing those he loved for what was to come, recalling the story of how God rescued his people out of bondage and gave them a promise of a new kingdom in which to live, flowing with milk and honey. I do wonder about the moment when the penny dropped for the disciples, when they understood who Jesus really was, the Lamb of God, and why he had to die on a cross, simply because he loved us. So let's hold on to those promises. Let's embrace times of preparation with patience and humility. And as deeply difficult as times are, we know, we know that the best is yet to come. Let's pray.